Good afternoon everyone, my name is Patrick O'Donnell and I'm a first year marine and freshwater biology student here at the University of Glasgow. And today I want to talk to you about the crown of foreign starfish, I want to talk about the unique biology behind this organism and how its niche traits makes it a particularly destabilising force in marine ecosystems. As well as that I want to talk about any kind of moral or practical implications involved in humans getting involved with their numbers. But before I get started, I just want to give you a little bit of my background. Before I came to Glasgow, I used to work as a scuba diving instructor in countries such as Thailand, Cambodia and Honduras. And it was my time in this profession that actually introduced me to the whole ethos, the environmental ethos behind scuba diving and what got me interested in this particular organism. Now you see, I think these look rather beautiful, but I can see why you'd think they look rather terrifying. They can grow as much as a metre wide. They're covered in venomous spines. And they are of particular concern in terms of the rate of coral that they eat. The average starfish can consume as much as 13 square metres of coral per year. And they feed by externalising their stomach onto the out exterior of the coral. And they cover it in digestive enzymes, which breaks down the outer surface and leaves nothing but a calcium carbonate <coughs> skeleton left afterwards. As well as that, they've got these magnificent regenerative properties, which is common throughout most starfish. And they actually found a group of marine biologists by the name of Mesmer, Pratchett and Clark. They actually cut the starfish in half and they discovered even if you do this to the starfish, they retain a 75% chance of regenerating into a whole new starfish. That's quite incredible. Okay, so imagine some of you are sat there thinking, that's a jolly nice starfish. But why should I be concerned about this organism living its life as it's naturally meant to? Well, this organism's quite unique. Normally, most animals, besides us, have a kind of equilibrium with their environment. But with this equilibrium, it's very easily upset in their case. And it's of particular interest in the Great Barrier Reef at the moment. As some of you may be aware, news came out from scientists last year that the future of the Great Barrier Reef is at risk and it could be at threat of perishing. And if you're going to look at the total coral cover loss over the last couple of years, the starfish makes up as much as 40% of total coral cover loss from in the Great Barrier Reef. Of course, these are largely anthropogenic effects because our activity in the area has led to their population booms. For one, we've got nutrient enrichment in coastal areas, which can lead to population booms. And as well as that, we actually actively remove one of their only natural predators, the triton snail, and sell it on for commodity purposes. And for this reason, population booms are common not just in the Great Barrier Reef, but throughout the Indo-Pacific as well. And as well as that, you also have to look at the multifaceted issue of how we got to this point with the Great Barrier Reef. You also have to look at the blame of energy companies. You have to look at climate change, coral bleaching, and as well as irresponsible diving practices that you find in the area as well. And you can see why Australia is so concerned about preserving the Great Barrier Reef. It's a natural world heritage site. It brings as many as 2 million tourists to Australia each year, and it provides as much as 5 to $6 billion to the economy, which is not a negligible amount considering their GDP runs at something like $1.5 trillion. But the most important aspect of it is the ecological aspect. If you were to lose the precious resources of the Great Barrier Reef, that means that you'd be looking at reduced fishing stocks in the area, and as well as that, it would have a larger macrological impact on the wider environment outside of the Great Barrier Reef, so migrating animals and so on and so forth would be hit by this. So if you imagine the Great Barrier Reef is like, say, a big city like the city of London, it doesn't just rely on the inhabitants that permanently live in that city, it relies on a constant traffic between different hubs from different cities commuting once a day, once a year, and those commuters provide the biodiversity you need to provide those essential traits that keeps the society together and keeps it functioning as it should. So you can imagine if something like London went and disappeared, it wouldn't just be a disaster for everyone living in London, it would be a disaster for the whole country and everyone that relies on it. And this the same is true with the Great Barrier Reef. As many as 30 different kinds of whale and <coughs> as many different kinds of whale and dolphin rely on the Great Barrier Reef as a safe harbor so they can reproduce, so they can feed, and also so they can raise their young in a safe environment. So it would be a disaster for them if the Great Barrier Reef was to disappear. And if you look at the biology behind the starfish, you can see why people are so concerned. Uh, average female can produce anything between 20 to 65 million eggs in a single breeding season. So their densities can increase very, very rapidly. And when you find in a case like 
a lot of starfish find themselves in, in somewhere as nice as the Great Barrier Reef. They don't have a lot of competition and they have a lot of food. So that means that the density can increase very quickly. And if you have more males per area of egg that you find in the Great Barrier Reef, then population booms are very likely to happen. And then when you end up in this situation, there's also a negative feedback effect because you find that starfish only have to compete amongst themselves. So normally they feed in the nighttime where it's safer and they don't have to worry about predators acting upon them. But now if they're in a safe environment like the Great Barrier Reef, that now means that they can predate in the nighttime as well, which actually increases the rate of coral cover loss. And as you can imagine, it wouldn't take too long before you can go from a lovely looking healthy reef like this do something like this. And the Australian government are actually so concerned about it, last year they started releasing autonomous starfish killing robots, like we live in the future, <laughs> to take care of the population. And what they do is they patrol the reef and then when they find one, they inject it with biosalts. And what it does is it disintegrates the starfish from the inside out over a 24 to 48 hour period. Now, that doesn't sound like the most ethical and slightly barbaric way to dispose of an animal, but there's two main things you need to take into consideration. Firstly, you need to take diver safety into account. And if you send down a diver with a machete to go hacking at something that's covered in venomous spines, no one's gonna think that that's safe practice whatsoever. Secondly, you also need to take into account uh, the regenerative properties of the starfish as well. When they initially sent divers to take care of the starfish, they went down with a machete, cut it in half, and they said, ah, good, we killed the starfish. No, they doubled the population. <laughs> <laughs> so they actually made everything far worse. So at the moment, even though it's not very nice, this is the most effective way of disposing of them. And this is not just an issue, as I said, for the Great Barrier Reef. You find population booms all over the Indo-Pacific region, ranging from India all the way over to the middle of the Pacific. And even though their numbers aren't as well monitored as they are on the Great Barrier Reef, we actually can see that in places like Thailand, where they're very common, you end up with population booms and they've had as much as 90% coral cover loss. You can recover from this, but generally you need quite urgent action. And normally a call is required to be able to get the numbers back up to where they were. If you find starfish in low numbers, say, one per hectare or something like that, then they only eat fast growing coral. So they're good for biodiversity. But as I said, our behavior affects theirs and unfortunately we can lead to their population booms. Now, of course, there's an ethical aspect to this debate because of course it's very, very contentious talking about culling an animal. Like the badger cull we had here in the UK drew people down the middle on whether it was ethically right, whether it was practical, whether it was sustainable. And some of you may take the more utilitarian view as I do, where I say the good for the greatest number is the greatest good. Some of you may say there's a moral line in the sand and you should not cross it. Well, in this area, my personal belief is after 200 years of a straight human population boom, the world's a very different place to what it once was. We've actually sculpted every inch of this planet for our energy needs, our housing needs, and our agricultural needs. And now the world that we see in David Attenborough's planet Earth is not is far rarer than you might think. And it's my personal belief that if we're going to engineer this planet, we should engineer it for the good of all. And on that point, I just want to leave my closing words with a quote from one of my favorite authors, Dr. Seuss from the book, The Lorax. And he says, I've sat here and worried and worried away through the years, while my buildings have fallen apart. I've worried about it with all my heart. But now, says the Wansler, now that you are here, the word of the Lorax seems perfectly clear. Unless someone like you cares a whole awful lot, nothing's going to get better. It's not. Thank you.
Uh, well, last year, the, everyone was very concerned about it. Uh, the media does put out quite hyperbolic statements so they can get interest in whatever they're saying. It's not the... It's not the death of the reef, but urgent action is required. Uh, it's not just for the removal of the crown and thorn starfish. I think it's one of the main culprits. It's, uh, if you're actually going to look at the amount of damage caused, the starfish only comes second to storms in terms of damage caused to the reef, which is incredible for one organism. But as I said, it's a multifaceted issue. And in my opinion, one of the things that we need to do that's not talked about so much is actually curving diver numbers in the Great Barrier Reef. So as much as people want to go see it, if you want to protect it, we need to stop as many tourists visiting it, at least in the short term. And that would help quite a lot. You put a lot of, uh, like, <laughs> it seems like the starfish is a big problem. Um, I just wanted to know, you probably don't have an answer to this. Um, the government, the Australian government is still investing in mining and <laughs> mm -hmm. doesn't seem to care a lot about the environment. I was wondering, as a scientist, is it quite, um, what's the word, um, frustrating to not have the, political people behind it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, no, the government has been, in terms of the coal mining industry, I don't know a lot about this, but I know the coal mining industry is very active in the area around the Great Barrier Reef. So yes, as I said, the energy companies have got their part in the damage. It's, yeah, it's very frustrating, especially like in terms of we've got Trump moving in and he's very anti-science. So yes, it's, it's very frustrating <laughs> when you see government stepping in and valuable scientific work, absolutely. Show your hands first. <laughs> and then we'll come to the one in the front. Whoa! <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, you mentioned that one of the reasons they're so abundant is that you're actually selling off their natural predator, mm -hmm. the Triton's Dale? Triton's Dale, yes, yes. that's correct, yeah. Um, so is it possible to, um, I guess, foster the population of the snails as a potential sort of restoration of the equilibrium? Um, I'm a bit more of a pessimist in this regard because, yeah, the Triton snail does consume the starfish, but it's not its main natural predator. So it would have an effect, but the extent of that, I'm not so sure, to be honest. No problem. And then down at the front. Yep. You ready? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, so my question was, uh, why does it matter if the coral is dead or alive? I mean, <laughs> 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 um, from like, because the structure will still be there, right? Whether the coral is alive or not. So like, mm. I mean, for fish laying their eggs and stuff, I mean, the, the, yeah. they would still be hidden and stuff. Yeah. Why does it matter? Uh, well, the coral kind of provides an infrastructure for the life around it to survive. So, yeah, no, you're quite right. You know, if you look at a graph of the population numbers of crown of horn starfish and reef cover, there are dips where you have lots of coral and then the population of starfish go up and then coral goes down, starfish numbers go down. So you have this kind of like fluxing between the two. But it, as I said, it's more you have to be concerned about the animals that rely on it. Um, as a safe haven. So if we remove the, so if there's a lot of coral cover, even if there's a lag for a couple of years, it could be disastrous for wider communities outside of the reef. Okay. Well, I think that probably brings us quite nicely to the time when we said that we would break for the next tea and coffee. So uh, I'll just finish by saying, I think finish this section by saying, I think we've had three talks there that all had quite, quite, um, messages in them that had maybe had elicited quite a strong response and I think that I want to try and harvest that to get you to think about <laughs> why you enjoyed or thought what you thought about those presentations and send your answers in here <laughs> right the more you reflect on it the better your presentations will be next time you go off and do one I promise you but it's also nice for these guys to hear that but tea and coffee is outside and we'll start again <laughs> 20 minutes, 25.